Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm JBD. Uh, I work at Google on our instrumentation team. Uh, my main focus on uh, is actually instrumenting Go servers. Um, and I was previously working on the Go team, uh, working mainly on uh, Go's diagnostic tools. Uh, today, I will talk about distributed systems observability at Google. So how many of you have heard about observability? I, I assume that it's, uh, it's I, I was expecting more in this audience. Um, since there are so many conflicted def this, uh, definitions of this term, I want to clarify my definition first. Um, what we call observability is this holistic approach uh, to be able to observe a system uh, for properties such as reliability, performance, deployability, and so on. Um, we look at multiple different signals in order to achieve that. Um, metric collection, distributed traces, profiles, logs uh, are few, few of those. Uh, this talk is mainly about the motivation and the core concepts that we came up with in the recent years uh, to make Go production systems more observable. So I said signals. Um, I'm not going to favor one signal type to another but rather focus on how we collect uh, signals and why we collect them the way we do. And uh, this talk is going to mention a lot about metrics, traces, and profiles, but don't assume that these are the only signals uh, we care about. So to give you a little bit of history, Google is dominantly a distributed systems company. Uh, one of the most common architectural patterns we use is microservices architecture. Uh, we have you know, 10 thousands of different microservices contributed and maintained by hundreds of different teams. And being able to observe our, sys um, our system is a fundamental reason uh, why Google is reliable, fast, and user-friendly. In order to be able to observe our systems, we care about instrumenting our systems, obviously. Uh, we in invented some collection methodologies and export formats, um, as well as you know, entirely new philosophies in this area. Our instrumentation stack cares about efficiency and the overall uh, overhead of the collection. Um, and I would say that observability is a part of our engineering culture. And we enable it by making it easy and also low overhead. Uh, before digging more into the uh, distributed systems observability, I want to briefly explain you why it is different. Uh, than um, you know, observing monolithic systems. This is a typical architectural diagram for pretty much every product at Google. Well, we usually have this user-facing business logic um, heavy uh, front-end server uh, that depends on other various uh, services. Authentication, billing, reporting are some of the examples here. Um, in this example, all of these relatively low-level services depend, depends on Spanner our database, and eventually hitting the blob storage service uh, for persistence. At any microservices architecture, it's very expected that some of the services are becoming such a common dependency. So when the rest of the company is you know, dependent on blob storage, it's harder for this team to gather meaningful metrics, you know, traces, uh, profiles, etc. cetera. Uh, it's hard for them to tell the root cause of the problems triggered by their users. Blob storage team will see some fluctuations maybe in their da dashboards, but will have a very hard time um, breaking, the da breaking down the data and figuring out where the problem is actually uh, originated at. It's also not only when uh, things are obviously going wrong. Infrastructure teams always wants to have some answers to be able to just say that you know, things are going right. Uh, some of examples of the questions they need answers for, um, hey, are we meeting the SLO for the Spanner team, right? Uh, are we providing them the service we promised to serve? As the blob storage, you need to be able to tell. Um, and you know, what is the impact of this high-level service on, the, on this low-level blob storage service? And what happens if this particular product uh, scales up 10% overnight? Uh, is the blob storage deployment going to be able to handle the new scale? So this is why we want to be able to break down our signals um, in various different ways. We call these different various ways dimensions. Uh, with dimensions, you can query the collected data um, in ways that will help you to you know, answer some of the earlier questions I had. 
uh, give me the blob storage request latency distribution for RPCs originated at you know, Google Analytics front-end server, for example. Or give me the traces in reports contains the specific RPC method. Or give me the CPU profile uh, for this library for the RPCs just generated at Google Analytics. So it's great that you know that we can query this data, but how do we really collect uh, signals in order to be able to query them this way and break down? Uh, the answer is we record the data uh, with various key value pairs. We call these key value pairs tags. And um, then the backend, for example, a metric collection backend such as Prometheus can filter data by tags. So the entire promise of, there's something very confusing here. The entire promise of microservices is that you have no tight coupling between services. How can a low level you know, service such as a blob storage can tag with the right thing if they don't know nothing about its dependence and their uh, maybe you know, business cases? This is where uh, we get help from context propagation. So the tags are actually proposed, uh, produced at the high level services and uh, passed to the lower level stack as a part of the RPC. You can see that from all the way up uh, from the bottom, uh, you can see the RPCs are tagged. So the blob storage doesn't have to know anything but can record the signals with the incoming tags. We have a culture of you know, producing these tags at high level services um, depending on the specific requirements of the teams. And we you know, propagate these tags all across the stack uh, with, as a part of RPCs. And each component in the system can uh, record metrics, profiles, and so on uh, with the incoming tags. As I mentioned in the beginning, we see observability as a holistic approach uh, because each signal type is useful to answer differing questions. Uh, for example, distributed traces are not going to be able to tell you about the CPU hotspots or CPU samples cannot tell us about the overall latency uh, end to end. Um, so we collect various signals and examine them uh, from very different perspectives and break down with the tags. It's um, impossible for developers to think about all these dimensions and signal types and build highly efficient instrumentation libraries and uh, you know, instrument each layer they depend on. That's why we built um, a common framework and decided to open source and make it vendor agnostic so anybody can use them with any provider. Uh, recently, we announced that we are um, our project, Open Census, which is a holistic instrumentation framework. It is inspired by Google's um, internal project called Census. The main reason we are uh, open source on this is we want to fill that missing, you know, building uh, gap in the open source world. We want libraries, frameworks, and all sorts of infrastructure uh, projects to be able to instrument uh, without having to uh, reinvent these concepts. We also want to, you know, help other organizations to adopt these um, solutions. And if they are not, uh, they can also use Open Census as a reference. So Open Census provides a single set of libraries. Um, we have tags, metrics, um, traces, and more is coming in the future. Uh, we have language support available today for Go, Java, and C++. Um, Python, PHP, JavaScript, C Sharp, and Erlang are coming next. Uh, the libraries are, instrumentation libraries are vendor agnostic, so uh, you can uh, upload data to any backend. Uh, we currently have support for Prometheus, Zipkin, uh, Jaeger, and some APM vendors. Uh, some, more, some, some other APM vendors are also thinking that this is a useful solution to instrumentation rather than inventing their own instrumentation libraries, so they are uh, working to provide uh, open census support. We provide out-of-the-box integration with some of the frameworks such as gRPC and um, net uh, HTTP packages. Also, um, libraries provide introspection and can render a tiny dashboard uh, from the process uh, that you know, contains um, a summary of what is going on in the process. Uh, without you know, having to rely on an external service, uh, you can see what is going on uh, in the scope of a server, and it's a very useful thing when you know that uh, pro the problem is at a specific process, or you, know, you can use it during the development time to see what is going on. 
So speaking of framework integrations, I just want to show briefly what it looks um, for gRPC. Um, at Google, we're also responsible for all the gRPC stubby observability, and these integrations are what we are planning to use internally at Google. Um, for now, you need to import this plugin and pass it as a stats handler uh, to the gRPC client and the servers. Uh, in this case, we're looking at the gRPC server. Um, you can see the new server stats handler. Uh, in the handler, you can ex extend the tags, in, you know, incoming tags uh, from the current context. Uh, in this case, I'm inserting hello um, as the originator server um, and inserting the user ID as well. Then, uh, you know, it will be impossible uh, for the backends uh, to break down the collected data with um, originator servers and user ID. This is um, how to record values. I have a measure total hello uh, that represents the number of times we said hello. Uh, stats record will say one uh, with the tags in the current incoming te te context. So uh, you will be able to tell the number of hellos uh, for the request originated at you know, whatever service or uh, by specific user. Um, then, you know, this is how it looks like in your dashboard. So you can break down the data by dimensions. Uh, in this case, the baby blue one uh, is the total number of hellos uh, from the RPCs originated at the out service. Uh, the purple one is the, you know, ones coming from the billing. And, the, you know, the other two colors are representing other services. So the gRPC plugin also automatically uh, creates uh, traces uh, for the incoming and outgoing RPCs. Uh, but you can also add uh, custom spans uh, by using our trace packages. Uh, here we are creating a custom child and finishing it. Uh, you can create as much as you know you want uh, and annotate them. Um, just you know propagate the context and whoever starting new spans, uh, you know the, the, whoever uh, the new spans will be basically you know, direct children um, of the current span in the current context. So here's an example of the traces uh, collected from an RPC. You can see the internal RPC is made uh, in order to satisfy the original incoming request. And um, Open Census also provides PPROF support. Uh, if you use tag do, um, it, we collect actually CPU samples uh, with the tags inside the uh, incoming context. And then you can see the hotspots um, in your code from very, you know, for specific requests, RPC names, and so on, uh, with the, you know, the dimensions you have defined as tags. Uh, this is a gRPC server I profiled with Open Census. Um, we're looking at the typical visualization uh, of PPROF data. Uh, you can see the runtime concat strings uh, spend 9.43 uh, seconds for RPCs coming from the authentication servers and 3.20 uh, seconds for the RPCs coming from the analytics servers. So let me focus on some of the core principles we have. Uh, one of our goals is to make instrumentation as much as possible uh, without our engineers thinking too much about the cost. This is why we have a separation between um, instrumentation and collection. Instrumentation, because instrumentation is cheap if you don't, you know, collect them. Like if you just drop the, well, whatever is collected, it's very cheap. So rather than collecting all the metrics, uh, we defer it to the end user to, you know, enable the collection. Um, the instrumentation bits are, you know, he, are left here and there and almost uh, zero impact on the critical path. And the end user, the end developer usually decides what to collect. Uh, this allows, you know, libraries and frameworks to instrument without worrying too much about the cost. Uh, they provide some, you know, measures, and then users are enabling uh, metric collection, for example, on the on the provided measures. Uh, as I mentioned in the play, uh, just right now, the, the collection requires explicit enabling, but this is also true for disabling. It, this allows us to dynamically enable uh, or disable collection in production. Uh, for example, imagine a GZIP library um, that has been instrumented to measure the compressed chunks. Um, it, until you're suspicious about this library, you don't have to you know, collect any metrics. Uh, but if you do, then uh, in the production, you can um, enable collection and start receiving metrics. So observing becomes very easy when you have a static list of you know, things to observe, but systems are usually surprising you. That's why we're encouraging a model that you can dynamically expand whatever you are collecting. 
We sample um, expensive and large data. Um, everything that is cheap to collect and aggregatable is usually don't have to be sampled. Um, examples of sample signals are traces because they are very big and uh, profiles because they are very expensive. Um, on the other hand, uh, we aggregate data in efficient ways to you know, produce cheap um, and small data to avoid sampling. And this is, for example, what we do for m uh, metric collection for we never have to you know, sample uh, our metrics. Um, you, you know, it's great uh, you don't have to sample the metrics because uh, this is how you see all the, you know, 1999 percentile uh, stats. So, um, I was repeating that the data size could be a reason why we aggregate or sample data. Uh, one of the uh, obvious other reasons is we want to be able to limit the outbound bandwidth uh, that, that is spent on data collection. For signals that are aggregatable like metrics, we try to aggregate them in process or near process and uh, to reduce the bandwidth. Um, we are either aggregating them in the process or by an agent that is living very close to the process and do the aggregation there. Um, at Google, we try to use you know same instrumentation libraries everywhere to provide uh, it's, you know when, when we're doing providing black box monitoring, we're trying to use the same libraries uh, for compatibility. Uh, for example, a trace can be started at our load balancer, and then our engineers can use the same libraries to add more uh, spans to to the existing trace. Um, similarly, our you know microservices frameworks like gRPC provides tags. Um, and a corset of you know instrumentation out of the box, so it's easy for our you know engineers to facilitate uh, what is already there and put stuff on top of um, top of it rather than you know thinking everything from the very uh, scratch. Uh, one of the other useful tools we have at Google is this introspection pages, uh, sort from the servers. Uh, you can imagine introspection um, is a small backend that collects and visualizes what is collected in the process. Uh, it's a great useful tool to understand um, what is happening, um, you know, without having to rely on a backend. Um, and also useful, you know, during the development time, as I mentioned. Um, here you see the traces page. Um, there's a small dashboard that displays spans of you know, from different names uh, and gives us the, you know, overall latency distribution. Um, you can see the details for 10 samples for each uh, distribution bucket and the errored ones. Uh, so you have a, you know, clue about uh, what is the main reason, main problem. To summarize, uh, we have a holistic approach. We use multiple signals, uh, metric traces, um, and more. Tags uh, allows us to break down data by dimensions. Each uh, team can produce them and pass them to the low-level services. Uh, we instrument our core frameworks um, and service meshes and you know, load balances out of the box, so users automatic, automatically get a lot of instrumentation, uh, out of the box instrumentation through them. And then uh, they can use you know, the same libraries to add fine-grained details. Um, just like uh, in the case of you know, creating custom spans in the gRPC example I had here. Um, our instrumentation layer is optimized uh, to be low overhead and low cost. Um, it makes it easier for libraries and frameworks to instrument uh, without thinking too much about the cost. And um, you know, once you adopt these concepts and put them in place, it gives you a good foundation layer. Um, Open Census is very similar to you know, all the approaches we have done internally and currently is available and vendor agnostic. Uh, we already have support for Prometheus, uh, Zipkin, Jaeger and more. Um, so I highly encourage you to you know, take a look and uh, give us feedback and contribute. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, do we have any questions? Put your hand up. Yeah, there's one there. Thank you. Um, how does this relate to open tracing? 
the open tracing? Uh, it's a common question we have. So um, one of the easy answers is we are a holistic approach. Um, open tracing is you know focused on tracing. And the way open tracing see themselves is more of an um, API, uh, not a real implementation. So they, uh, we, our data models are quite compatible. Um, and uh, we can currently say that like, if there is open tracing instrumentation there, we can actually you know, convert it to our instrumentation and you can still use the, you know, our exporters, backend exporters to export the data. Uh, we are talking to open tracing right now to see if we can actually get on similar page in terms of naming. Um, but it's a little bit difficult because we have you know, tags, for example, dimensions decoupled, um, whereas open tracing uh, puts as, you know, has as, as a part of the tracing API. So we're, we're discussing and seeing what we can do. Next question. Is this open? Okay. So <clears throat> one of the problems of monitoring and collecting data from services is when a service has a problem or crashes, the data that it generates is much higher. Depending on the design of the application, it can be five times, 20 times more. You talked about aggregators on the node, want to collect node. I mean, what is the rule of thumb? How much data should produce more of the system? So it, it really depends, but at Google we have this other concept of um, having aggregators outside of the process. Um, so we usually have um, agents located nearby and you know collect raw metrics sometimes and like um, use that you know additional agent to export the final thing. And uh, it, it depends on the you know the, the latency um, expectations you have um, and the bent you know the the uh, expense uh, between you your process and uh, the agent. Um, so the, the question is because we, ha we face this problem is um, what would be your advice on the percentage of like in size how much data would make sense to produce? Uh, you're talking about specifically like how much data we should buffer. Yes. Uh, it's, it's again hard to say like a, it's really hard to say like there is one typical rule. Um, so <laughs> you just need to experiment for your case. And again, you need to, I think, uh, be able to depend on different models to export. Um, you know, you can export from the agents rather than the process or the process. Um, I, I mean, I cannot like tell one rule. Um, there's one perfect rule that works. Next question. Put your hand up. It's like school, because it is a school. Okay. So I'm going to ask a question. Sure. Uh, you say that it's very low overhead. What would be the typical number of nanoseconds taken for an event you're throwing away? And nanoseconds of what? Uh, for you said the instrumentation is low overhead. So if you have an event for which there is no use of it further on, what, what sort of cost? I don't really have. Uh, so the ideal thing is um, we drop the events. We we collect uh, metric collection, for example, it happens this way. Uh, we collect the record events. Um, we drop them if there there is no one subscribed. And um, there, we need to still iterate those events. And it's just like very minimal. Usually we just omit it. I don't have like real benchmarks for the Go implementation right now, which I am responsible for. So I cannot tell. <laughs> and this project is just, you know, <laughs> in the early stages. But uh, for our uh, C++ implementation internally, we just like really don't care too much. Any other questions? Going three, two, one. Thank you very much. Thank you.